Good morning, saints of our Lord, and welcome to Thy Strong Word. I'm your host, Brady Finner, and pastor of Messiah Lutheran Church in Sartell, Minnesota. Thank you for tuning us in this morning on Worldwide KFUO, Christ for you anytime, anywhere. A blessed Easter to all of you this Friday, May the 13th, as the light of Christ continues to shine on us from 1 John. And I tell you what, 1 John chapter 4 is well, not my favorite. I keep saying that throughout this whole epistle, but it is so powerful, powerful, so full of grace, so full of God's love in Christ that it is something that is actually engraved inside of my wedding ring, something that my wife and I chose for our wedding day, that God is love in that in this love, not that we have loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. Not only for your wedding day, but for you as a baptized child of God. This is what your identity is, loved by Christ. And we're going to learn about those words once again, propitiation and other type words, for this is so full of grace, the love of God poured into our hearts. So let's enjoy. Open up your Bibles, put on your Christ goggles for the gifts are ready ready for you. We want to give thanks to our friends at Lutheran Heritage Foundation for supporting Thy Strong Word. Visit lhfmissions.org for more information, lhfmissions.org. Helping us to be strengthened by God's Word this morning, we welcome back Pastor Nabil Neuer of Trinity Lutheran Church in Hartford, South Dakota. Pastor Neuer, a blessed Easter, alleluia, Christ is risen, and welcome to Thy Strong Word. He is risen indeed. Hallelujah! Amen to that wonderful blessing and greeting as we begin to swim in the ocean of God's loving word that enhances our lives, open our eyes, calms our spirit, and help us to look forward to the glory of paradise. Pastor, how what's going on for you, your family, and the work of the saints at Trinity? Well, the good news, we just moved from a smaller house to a bigger house, the oh. mansion, and we're invited to come and stay. Yeah. Um, the reason we did that, because our family is getting bigger and uh, larger. By that, I mean the, the grandkids are getting older and taller. One of them is even actually taller than me, and it just makes it that much easier. As far as what is going at Trinity, the goodness of God continues to ooze. In so many different ways, the Lord has blessed us throughout the Lenten and Easter season to proclaim the wonderful tidings that the victory is ours in Christ. The saints are being fed, being nurtured, being empowered and exhorted to live to the glory of God, both in word and in deed. And to that, I am forever grateful that they want me. You understand that? They weren't mean that the Yosef from Palestine, Nazareth, to be the pastor of a little church in the country so that I may bring them God's great and glorious good news. To proclaim the excellencies of he who has called us out of darkness into his marvelous light. I mean, what an honor when we when you actually stop and think about it, right, Pastor? Is This is what we're called to do. For all of you, our listeners, this is what you receive, and this is a joy that we have in the scriptures. I think all we can say to that is, once again, hallelujah, Christ is risen. He is risen indeed, hallelujah, and I will put the definitive you know, mark on it by saying, amen. Amen. So with that amen, knowing that this is true, Pastor, we're digging into some great words today from our Lord. So can you begin our time in prayer? I would be more than honored and delighted. Let us pray. Lord, God, Almighty Father, thank you for your great love in sending your Son for our redemption and salvation. May others see this love in us both in word and deed, and may you receive all the glory for all that you have done for us loving us when we were unlovable. In the name of him who is love, Christ Jesus, our Lord, we pray. Amen. Amen. If you have any questions concerning our text today, send us an email. Send us an email, kfuo at kfuo.org, kfuo at kfuo.org. And as we're studying First John chapter 4, here's what I'm going to do. 
I'll start by reading all of our verses, one, so that we can hear it a few times over today, but two, when you put it all together, there's a wonderful theme that when you look at the English Standard Version Bible and in other versions, it just says the title, God is Love. And this is important for us, one, to bask in that, to just to rest in that, but also to confess it faithfully because it also can be abused. So today we ask for the Holy Spirit to guide us as we hear God's word, 1 John chapter 4, beginning in verse verse 7, excuse me. Beloved, let us love one another, for love is from God, and whoever loves has been born of God and knows God. Anyone who does not love God does not know God, because God is love. In this, the love of God was made manifest among us, that God sent his only Son into the world so that we might live through him. In this is love, not that we have loved God, but that he loved us and sent his Son to be the propitiation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God. If we love one another, God abides in us and his love is perfect in us, perfected in us, excuse me. By this, we know that we are abide in him and he in us because he has given us of his spirit. And we have seen and testified that the father has sent his son to be the savior of the world. Whoever confesses that Jesus is the son of God, God abides in him and he in God. So we have come to know and to believe the love that God has for us. God is love, and whoever abides in love abides in God, and God abides in him. By this, love is perfected with us, so that we may have confidence for the day of judgment, because as he is so, also are we in this world. For there is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear. For fear has to do with punishment, and whoever fears has not been perfected in love. We love because he first loved us. If anyone says, I love God and hates his brother, he is a liar. For he who do, does not love his brother whom he has, cannot see, love, has seen cannot love God whom he has not seen. And this commandment we have found from him. Whoever loves God must also love his brother. This is our, the word of the Lord this morning, Pastor. There's, there's a, thanks I, I, be to God. Yeah, thanks be to God. I found myself tripping up quite a bit because it feels like you're kind of going back and forth quite a bit. How do you want to begin with the with our um, some main themes or thoughts before we dig in? Well, I have three points I want to highlight. First, I'm thankful to God in His great mercy that He allows me to be, to be with you today on Friday the thirteenth. Mm. Out of all all days, a day where people are so terrified. Of so fearful and so um, overcome with anxiety, this verse throws all of that away. So that's the first point. Mm -hmm. Number two, I want you to realize that this first and foremost, that is a love, this, in quotation mark, this love comes from God and not from us. Mm -hmm. So the author of our salvation, the agent, of our salvation, the administrator of our salvation is God, because God is truly, capitalized word, love, and from him oozes that love. And if you look at it, whether it's the English or the original language in the Greek, there's over 20 times love, beloved, you know, uh, to love, and all of these things, of course, the Greek makes it more clear, but sufficient even in the English, if you were to highlight all of the words with the word love is found, it is astonishing in these verses how many times the word love is written. Thirdly, which I think is very important, in these verses from verses Four, excuse me, from verse 7 through 19, we have all the Christmas and Easter story. Unlike Luke, what he tells us that, but if you begin in verse 8, we know that God sent forth his son in humiliation so that he might come to earth. And you can look at it, we are told that, as well as in verse 10, we have the Easter victory, 
Christ becomes our propitiation. And in verse 11, we are to be his witnesses. So in these few verses, we have the glorious Christmas message, the glorious victory of Easter, and then we who have been at the manger and at the empty tomb go out with great joy and tell the world, just like the shepherd, all that they had seen and heard. And what a wonderful, wonderful, wonderful thing. And finally, I, I said there are three points, but finally, I also want to identify for the people who are listeners and may not have known that in truth, in the, in the Greek language, there are four ways to describe love. Of course, in the English, we don't have it, but you have agape, you have philea, you have storge and era. Agape is that unconditional love that sees beyond our surface and accepts us as we are, but does not keep us as we are. Phileo is an affectionate kind of love, like Philadelphia. It's a platonic love, a brotherly love. Storge is the love of a family, where a mother is so involved emotionally by caring for her child. And of course, the last one is eros, where we get the word erotic in Greek, in English, of course. And that tells us the four different. But in this portion of the living word, the life-changing, life-enhancing word, we have only one Greek word used here. And I think you would, you know, Brady, which one it is. It is agape. Agape sein, agapa, egopen, all of these different forms of agape to point us to the one who is love. And if, when you look at the Greek, and I'm looking at an inner, inner linear right now, it just pops out absolutely everywhere. Like you said, over 20 times this love is, is highlighted. So, yeah, aga, 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 basically. You just see it over and over and over and over again. And so it really is amazing to think of that this is not only love, but it's unconditional love. And in almost, we all realize that there's a lot of conditional love in our world. So, Pastor, the, Think about, let me, let me ask you this before we dig in, is God's unconditional love, how would you compare that to the um, conditional love that we often will see in our culture? Well, our culture, not only, we, you and I are not immune from uh, conditional. You know, you said you're married and you're yeah. on your um, uh, ring, your wife, and you put those sex. Yep. But let me put you on the spot, Brother Brady. Have you ever gotten mad at your wife? <laughs> Yes. yes you now, I, we are in it now. Yeah, I have. Okay. So, you know, during those moments, uh, because whether she didn't do what you expected or she said something you did not anticipate or she hurt you by statement, then all of a sudden you, you pout and you turn your back and you say, golly, did I really do the right thing here? Right? Mm. So that's the world. That's how we view, uh, conditional for us. You do this for me. I'll do this for you. Okay? It's, uh, you know, um, so it is uh, responsive to what we do or what others do for us. Unlike God's love, God does not act like a child. He loves us, and I love these terms that I have coined, in spite of us. His love is unconditional unmerited, unearned, okay? And of course, throughout the few verses here, I was going to count the words, but I didn't. But throughout these few verses from 7 through 19, the focus is always upon the one who is love and how he has loved us. This is a foreign language to our culture and to us personally, because we are sinners and we expect to be treated in the way we would help others to be treated. And if they don't, forget it. I don't love you, baby. Go away from me. But God says, come to me. 
And that's the beauty of this text, because we really see in words what God does. In words, we see him extending his hands of mercy, his grace, his forgiveness. In love, we see the art of who Christ is and why he came to earth. And this is why I said this is really the story of Christmas and Easter and the church at work in the world today. Well, we're going to get the whole story today, Christmas, Easter, our whole lives as Christian people. So let's start digging in. Um, We'll begin with, well, I mean, I think every verse is amazing. So let's get to it. Verses seven and eight, seven and eight. Beloved, let us love one another for love is from God and whoever loves has been born of God and knows God. Anyone who does not love does not know God because God is love. So, Pastor, there's two things here. It says who God is and where love comes from. And what's the answer? Simply, God is the answer. Before we go too deep into this, Please. okay, I want our uh, listeners to go to 1 John chapter 3, oh. verse 1, and that really sets the tone. This is the foundation that helps us to realize what God is doing. See what kind of love the Father has given to us. That's not a very good translation. It should be, uh, has lavished upon us Mm. that we should be called, what? Children of God. And so we are. The reason why the world does not know us is that it did not know him. That verse is a foundational to chapter 4, where John begins, and continues to emphasize where does love come from, okay? Mm -hmm. If you could in your mind, Brady, and you, beloved saints, is listening to me speak here, if you can envision God is up in heaven and there's a huge funnel, not like the tornado, but a funnel, and out of that drifts and oozes love both into our ears and into our heart and upon our lips. This is why John emphasizes, Beloved, who are you? You are God's child. You are the beloved one. He claims you in the waters of baptism. You are here. Now, let us love one another. Why? Because the act of loving has already been planted in our heart. For love is from God, and whoever has been born, and we are, through the uh, majestic word of baptism, knows God, and then he goes on, anyone who does not love does not know God because God is love. So a child of God knows where that love comes from, and in that love he acts, he behaves, he works, and he does. As um, the Apostle Paul in Ephesians um, 2 verse 10, he says we are a poem, or may I is the Greek word, to do good works. What we do is because of the gift of love that saves us, and thus we live in that wonderful thing. Now, I may not know all the brothers out there, but you love them. Why? Simply put, Brady and other saints out there, because God loved them Mm. as well. And it speaks very very clearly throughout this book that God, that Jesus has died for the world. So we can say one, God loves them. And in that love, we are able to say that Christ died for them. And that's, and that's a very powerful comfort, first of all. Um, but second of all, to be able to be able to tell them that love, because we don't say, well, he might've died for you. I'm not sure. You know, no, we don't say that. We say, no, he died for you. And we pray that by the Holy Spirit, they are able to confess Jesus as Lord. To me, that's a great comfort when we do talk about faith and talk about Christ and and his love, that we're able to say those powerful words. Christ did die for you. And that's something that is, uh, that encompasses all this with God's love. Any other thoughts, seven and eight? Yeah, I'm going to add just a little bit of what Dr. Luther once said. Mm. He says, I'm so thankful that in John 3, 16, God did not 
say I died for Martin Luther. And the reason for that is because he thought maybe there's another Martin Luther out there. So I don't want to doubt his love, but that love is for the cosmos, for the whole world. And in that world, you and I belong to him. That's why it is so precious. Even here in this uh, portion of the word, he sent his son for the benefit of the world. Whiskey. If you look at verse 9, okay, yep. uh, and he, in the, I'm translating from the Greek, he sent, that is God sent into the cosmos, into the world, in order that we might live through him. This is the cosmos. If you put your name underneath that, and I put my name, I am included in this world, Brady, so that everybody would know without a doubt, God sent his son, and we will come to the propitiation before too long in verse 10, that's the Easter victory, that he did it for the world, for you, for me, so that we would never doubt his enormous and unbelievable and unfathomable love. And what a love story this is. So on that, let's go to verse 10, because I want to make sure before we get to our break in about four minutes that we go through an important word because we, we can say God is love and that love is for us. But I think verse 10 really unpacks the meaning of this love. Because I can say, I love you, but if I don't ever do anything for you, then you're always going to wonder if I actually love you. In verse 10, it tells us what that is. So in verse 10, in this is love, not that we have loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. Pastor, I'm going to start with the big word right away. So that I think that runs through this whole text. Propitiation. What does that mean? Whoa, man, you're putting me on the... Ah, I know. You like, that? Well, I, I, it, I know. You like it though. You like it. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Actually, the Greek word is teleturion, which is to cover us, to, to be propitiated. Literally, is what God does in the Old Testament when the Shekinah comes down on the temple. And that's if you look at the. Um, what is the Greek translation of the Hebrew? I just cannot slip my mind here. Um, the Tepijan, okay? Mm -hmm. In the Tepijan, it's the same word used here, which literally, God covers our sins. He be the son to be the propitiation. That is to say, Christ, uh, I don't want to take uh, the word of what Paul does, uh, the sweet exchange. He literally covers us up or covers our sins up so that when God looks at you and me, he does not see me. He see me, he, he does not see me with my sin. He sees me without sin on account of his son. And Revelation catches that quite a bit also. Father Brighton used to say that to us in, mm. uh, in class. That big propitiation word that God does this for us. And, um, Prior to the propitiation, we have the word pari, or uh, after that, pari. Uh, the word there in the Greek, pari, is to say, this is just for you, or on your behalf is a good translation also, for our sins. So whatever sins we have, Christ, the Son of God, the Lamb, gives his life, and by his blood, we are cleansed of this sin, and he covers all of it. So when God looks at you and me, he only sees the crimson blood of his son shed on Calvary's cross for us. It's a big word, but boy, it's a rich word, more than a billion dollars worth, because it talks about eternity and salvation and life with God forever. Amen. And that's where to be covered up, like you said, all you can see is the crimson blood of Christ that has covered all of our sins. So you no longer see our sins. You see his perfect blood, which is just, 
how do you say it? There's a protection in that, you know, uh, um, if you cover somebody else up, you're covering them to protect them from something. That's kind of the vision that we would see. And the wrath that would, would certainly should be for all of us, he takes upon himself. I, I think that's a powerful image. You know what, Pastor? We're going to have to go to our break right now. Um, we are studying 1 John chapter 4 with Pastor Nabil Neuer of Trinity Lutheran Church in Hartford, South Dakota, and we'll be right back. Take a look around you. Look closely. Immigrants in the United States and their U.S.-born children now number about 81 million people, or 26% of the population. So chances are, there's someone right in your community who doesn't speak English as a first language and who doesn't know Jesus. The Lutheran Heritage Foundation can help by providing you with free Lutheran books translated into over 90 languages. See their complete list of catechisms and Bible storybooks at lhfmissions.org. And welcome back. We are studying 1 John chapter 4 with Pastor Nabil Neuer. And Pastor, we just got done defining that word propitiation, covering our sins, protecting us, taking on that wrath that we deserve, and he covers us up. Pastor, anything else that you want? I mean, this theme just keeps running through and through and covers us up with his grace this morning. So anything else with 7 through 10 you want to highlight? Yes, I do. Um, you remember, I grew up in Israel, so I'm thankful for the Hebrew knowledge that I have. In the book of Ruth, chapter 2, and I believe it's in uh, verse 12, uh, Ruth is laying on the floor of the uh, uh, rushing floor, and um, right at the feet of Boaz, and she says to him, cover me with your garment. In other words, you take me and protect me and be my husband. And that's the image that we have right here. And this is where we tie it, dear brother and beloved saying, that we, the church, are the bride of Christ. In that propitiation, God takes us and makes us holy and presents us to God the Father because Christ has covered us up. He protects us. He provides for us, and he promises never to forsake us. And his love is constant, and is etched in blood on the wooden tree of the cross. So let's move forward in that love, covered up. I love the Ruth connection. I love going through the book of Ruth. It's one of my favorite um, Bible studies that I've done recently is Ruth. And, and it's a great understanding of that visual um, it's a visual reality of our life as, as, as Christians. So 11 and 12 then extends us out. It's almost like God's pushing us out and reminding us this love is for you. And then therefore, what does he lead us to do? So 11 and 12, beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God. If we love one another, God abides in us and his love is perfected in us. So it, it, he gives us some instructions. What does he tell us? Well, here's one of the commands within this one. Uh, the love that we show is commanded. Love one another as I have loved you. Jesus said the same things, right? And so what we have right here, because we, that is you and I, all of those who follow the Savior, well, excuse me, all of us who follow the Savior and know that love, we cannot keep that love only for ourselves. But we use the currency of love and spend it on others by loving them. I often tell my saints of Trinity, you are little Christ to the world both in your word and in your deed, you reveal that love and, and they will come to know who you are, a child of God. 
And if you look at our world as it is today, if it was not for the Christians, dear brother, this will be a terrible place to live. If it was not for Christians, we would not have schools. If it was not for Christians, we would not have orphanages. If it was not for Christians, we would not have colleges and you know, high school and grade school. If it was not for Christians, we would not have hospitals and clinics. If it was not for Christians, we would not have mercy missions around the world. It is Christians that carry out the task. Love, in my book, love is more than an emotion. It is a lot of hard work. And we have lost the focus by that because we use it so blatantly, loosely, without, without realizing what that word is. I'm going to say it because I know where you live, uh, Brady. I love the Vikings. <laughs> really? Do they love you back? <laughs> I love pizza. Does pizza say thank you for eating me? I love my car. Fill in the blank, right? We have reduced that word, love, to all animate items. But love is active, is moving, is doing, is caring, is sharing. Love is making a phone call. Love is taking the hot dish when someone is sick. Love is putting a, an arm around somebody who's weeping. Love is listening. Love is giving. Not money. I'm not talking about money. Love is given of ourselves as God in love has given to us his own, his only son, to be our propitiation. And in that love, we go out and perfect the world around us. And if it wasn't for love, we wouldn't be who we are. And I'll share this before we go to the next portion. There's a lady in Jamestown, Missouri, an elderly lady, a black lady, who had come to visit St. James at church. And as the pastor began the uh, service, he said, Beloved in the Lord, and she started to weep. Why? She wept. She was over 40 years old before she heard this word. And he said, That's the first time somebody called me beloved. Beloved of God, that's who you are, and that's who I am. We are the beloved of the Lord. And I'm so thankful that he loved to come like me. And that's, a, that's our identity. That's who we are. Beloved, beloved by our Lord. And therefore, we are able to not only tell others that they're beloved, but we also treat them as beloved. And I love how you said this, uh, Pastor, that we see the acts of mercy that extends from this love of God that, like you said, love is only from God and that it comes from him. And so when we love others, it is God working through us, if that's a good way to say it. And you see that in our world, because like, for example, in our community here, uh, surrounding community, you have almost explicitly all the service agencies that will serve the poor, that will serve families that will serve, uh, um, just other, you know, the financial issues, those kind of, those kind of situations, low income housing, almost all of it has some kind of Christian background, Salvation Army or Catholic Charities. Um, there's a place of hope, which is a, 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 a Pentecostal ministry. Uh, there's other Lutheran agencies that work within this culture to make sure that the least of these are continually being served. And so we see God's love at work let alone what we see in the local parish, our own congregations, as our Lord extends his hand of mercy to us continuously. May we, by his Holy Spirit, by his strength, do the same in our in our lives. Any any thoughts on that? Like you said, we tell them we're beloved and we treat them that way too. Right. Um, I don't know if you have that in your church or you've seen it someplace. Um, there are many of our evangelical Lutheran churches that have a sign uh, just at the front door, 
we enter to worship, we accept to witness. Mm -hmm. Because yep. when we hear the message, what do we do? We take it out. You know, it isn't any different that when my wife and I got engaged, I gave her the diamond. Do you think she put her finger uh, in her pocket, her hand in her pocket, or did she push it out in front of people to see it? <laughs> yeah. And that's, that's the way it is. It is such a joyful thing for us as Christians to express the reality of who we are. I am the beloved of the Lord. One of my favorite four, actually five words that starts with me that I address quite often when I speak to my saints at Trinity. Here they are. Are you ready? Mm -hmm. If you want to write them down, go ahead. Baptized. Beloved, beautiful, blood, blood, children of King Jesus. You find that almost, not always, but almost in all of my sermon. That four words were actually five because you have blood, both and kind of two separate words, but with a hyphen in the middle. Baptized, beloved, beautiful, blood, blood, children of King Jesus. I remind them of that daily, as often as I can, whether it's in Bible study or in my sermon, so that they may know who they are, because the world, the devil, and our sinful flesh. Oh yeah, you bet. You are the beloved. Look at you. How do you live? Oh, look at you. You're ugly. Look at you. You don't even know what you're doing. That's how the devil whispers in our ears. Did God really say? Yes, he did say. And what he said is written on the wood of the cross. That's love. Look at the cross. Study it. See him hanging there. No, he did all of this because of you. So that you might be and ever will be his beloved, beloved child. And what a wonderful, what a wonderful thing there is for us, dear brother. And to realize it and to bask in it is beyond explanation, you know? Uh, that is, um, it is so helpful that we really, um, I don't know, what's the word I want to use? Sometimes we don't really uh, comprehend the magnitude of what that love is. It is such a special thing. And again, what I said earlier to you um, is that we have diluted that word and we have robbed it. Um, we have robbed it of what it is because we reduce it to so many things that is not really, um, I shouldn't say helpful, but it is not really beneficial. I mean, come on, do you really, uh, uh, do you really believe that the pizza loves you? Honestly, come on. Uh, we have a beautiful hand, Brother uh, Brady, that I like to read at least one stanza of that. And it Please. is called the hymn, My Song is Love Unknown. Mm, amen. My song is love unknown, my Savior, love, my Savior's love to me, love to the loveless Joan, that they may lovely be. Oh, who am I that for my sake my Lord should take frail flesh and die? Now, that in itself is a sermon right here. I just quit preaching. I'm done for today. The rest is a bit bonus. But <laughs> this, this, is, this is the truth. I mean, my song is love unknown. Who has the mind of God to see him loving is come like us? And if you think of David, in, John, in uh, Psalm 8, he says, who am I? I'm a worm. Yeah. Why would God from heaven look at me and still love me? So, Pastor, that's a great reminder of this wonderful hymn during the Lenten season, My Song is Love Unknown. There's opportunities we have as Christians, and I encourage our listeners that if you need a sermon, you know, you can look on YouTube and everything else, but read a hymn, sing a hymn if you want to. The, the love and the beauty of this one is, it, it really relates to our text because my song is love unknown, God's love, my Savior's love to me, love to the loveless, meaning us, shown that they might lovely be, meaning 
that we are able to say what, what Pastor Neuer has been saying this whole time, that his love is so great that he takes the loveless and he makes us lovely. And then that's a wonderful message for us to say, which is what Pastor said, baptized, beloved, beautiful, blood bought, children of King Jesus. That is a great reminder. Write it down, remember it, and uh, continually proclaim it to other people. Pastor, we're going to run out of time if we don't keep moving forward. And there's some great stuff for us to continue with. 13 through 15. By this we know that we abide in him and he in us because he has given us of his spirit. And we have seen and testified that the father has sent his son to be the savior of the world. Whoever confesses that Jesus is the son of God, God abides in him and he in God. So we're, we're going around and we're just receiving the message a little bit differently every single time. What are your thoughts on these verses? Well, you have to remember, John, the beloved of the disciple is a Jewish, right? And how do Jewish people communicate with others? Not like Americans in the West. Uh, linear, he does it cyclical, that is, in a circle. Mm -hmm. He says something, he comes back and says it again, he comes back and says it again, and it enhances us. What he's saying here is the same with what was said earlier in verse 10, you know, that God sent his only son, again, for the benefit of the world, right? In verse 14, where we have seen and testified that the Father has sent his son to be what? So Seraphim, the savior of the world. Okay, and again, the word is the cosmos. So he, he does this all out of love. This is the love that is within us and makes us one with the Father. Jesus in the upper room, John 13, 14, 15, 16, and 17, he tells us that God sent him because of love, right? And then in verse 17, he prays for the unity that we would be one as he and the Father is son. And he and the Father are one, excuse me. Mm -hmm. And so as the beloved of God, we know that the Savior came for me and I am his forevermore. And no matter what the world says about me, no matter what others think of me, I am loved by God, and that is enough for me. And then the question comes, how do I know that? How do I know that I'm loved by God? And that's kind of a question he's asking. He's answering that question without asking the question. He says, you know, uh, God is love, and whoever abides in love abides in him, and God abides in him, so forth. And he says, how do we know that you confess that Jesus is the son of God, God abides in him and he in God. So there's that, to be able to say that Jesus is Lord reminds us that God is abiding with us, in us, and that we are therefore abiding in him as well. What's the power in that? What's the comfort in that, Pastor? Well, first we have the spirit, because in John chapter 14, the Lord that I'm going to give you the comforter and he will teach you and remind you of all that I have said. Mm. So the spirit is at work within us. That's one. Number two, the confession we make does not have to be on the side of the road with a sign John 3.16. That's not what God is asking us. He's asking us to be his witnesses, again, both in word and in deed. We talked about some of these things earlier, so I'm not going to rehash it. But Somebody's hurting. What do you do? You go to visit, right? You as a pastor, you take the Lord's Supper to people who can't come to the Lord's house. Uh, you take um, a letter and you send it to somebody who's hurting or lost a loved one. Those are the things that we do. Why? Because he abides in our heart. Our hearts become the nest. Okay, if you want to use that imagery, where God dwells and our hearts overflow that the love just begins to ooze out in all that we say and in all that we do. Pastor, anything else in those verses before we move on? Well, the great confession is we are always confessing God. Sometimes for the good and sometimes for the bad. How many times have you heard of people say, oh, and I thought she was a Christian, right? Mm. We make confession whether we say things or do things, we make confession. And so we need to be aware of who we are because we represent Christ. You know, 
um, a long time ago in a Bible study, I thought to the people, I said to the people of my congregation, my beloved saints, we are Christians. What does that mean? We have Christ, and the last word, I am, I am nothing. Christ and only Christ. It's all about Christ. That's all it is. I am nothing. I can do nothing. But Christ can do through, uh, through me and in spite of me because he abides in me and the Spirit reminds me of what he has done for me. It's kind of like during Pastor Appreciation Month when Pastor got a, a card and it said, Pastor, we love you, but you're still number two because Jesus yep. is always number one. <laughs> Amen to that. I love it. I would have framed, if I would have framed that uh, card that somebody gave that to me, I would have framed it. I would have made my own frame and put it there. I love it. I absolutely love it. So let's keep moving forward. We'll go 16 through 19. Great words, graceful words for us today. So we have come to know and to believe the love that God has for us. God is love. Whoever abides in, in love abides in God and God abides in him. By this is love perfected with us so that we may have confidence for the day of judgment because as he, as he is, so also are we in this world. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear. For fear has to do with punishment and whoever fears has not been perfected in love. We love because he first loved us. Now, Pastor, I'm going to have to start with this because we did receive a question before our study today. And this question has to do with verse 18. So you tell them if you want to answer it now or you want to answer it later. But it says, perfect love casts out fear. And the, the question really is just simply, what does this mean? Because that can, what is it referencing? Because this person, I'm trying to paraphrase this, basically is saying that, He's heard this used like in a relationship and saying perfect love casts out fear like in a marriage or in a, a friendship or something and was not in reference to God. So how would we as Christians speak those words um, about well, perfect love casts uh, out fear? I'm just looking at the original. It says, don't be fearful. Why? Because God um, is love. Okay. The proper love is in him, but uh, you will be perfect in love because love is being cast out. And the Greek word is very strong. It's the same thing as in Matthew 4, where Christ is cast out into the wilderness. Mm. Why is that? It's the same word that's used in Matthew 4, okay? Ex balo, to be cast out, just like somebody take a baseball bat and throws it out. That's what we have. But why is it? There is no fear in love. Why? Because remember what I just said a few moments ago for you, dear brother? And all of you saints, Christ is within my heart. Where Christ is dwelling in me, there is no room for fear. Because mm. Christ is love. And in that love, and in that love, we become perfect. And that love literally throws out fear because there's no room for it. Okay? So if you take a child and you instill in him that love, he's not going to be fearful. But you bring a stranger into the mix, and what happens? There is fear. But you put him in the atmosphere where love is, that love will drive out fear, and that's how we are being perfected in love. Mm. So the love, I mean, we're talking about, this is God's love casting out this fear, kind of like uh, uh, when there is Christ, there is no darkness. In him, there is no darkness yep. at all. Kind of the same, same imagery, Amen. I think. Amen. Right? Yeah. And here's the, here's the other reason I think maybe what would be very helpful for this beloved saint is this. The devil always wants to plant the seed of the doubt. That's really, does God really love him, right? Right. He's always doing that. You've done this. You've done that. You didn't do this. You didn't do that. Look at you, right? But God says, hey, I love you for who you are, but I will never keep you as you are because I will mm. make you better. We are a new creation. And in that, there is no love. That's absolutely, there is, excuse me, there is no fear. Today is the Friday the 13th. And so people are so fearful, so anxious. Why? Because they do not know the magnitude of who God is and what he has accomplished for us. And so when you dwell, here's the key point, because we talked about remaining 
kind of like in John 15, that I don't know how many times the word remain in me and I, you know, it's the same thing right here. If we remain in God, that's the key. We are connected. It's a word and sacrament. We are connected to God. That's what we hear. Son, be of good cheer. Your sins are forgiven you, right? These are the words that drive our fear. When we are disconnected from Christ, when we listen to the world and ourselves, then fear is there. Because as we began this um, Bible study, we talked about conditional love. Well, you, if you do this, then I'll do this. If you do this, I'll do this. But not with God. This is what we talked about in the hymn, when song is love unknown. And in that, he makes the love, love, love a bowl. Mm. Okay? Mm -hmm. Why do you love me? Because of who God is, not because of who I am. And that's very important distinction for us. So, Pastor, here's here's one of the questions I think I have, and it's just kind of a good discussion for us, is a lot of times in our culture, you know, we'll have signs that will say, love wins. Or from a more... Well, uh, say that again. Love, love what? wins. Love wins. Oh, love wins. I, I won, you know. I won a baseball game. Love wins. And it's usually very political. You also hear very more liberal ends of Christianity or of, of kind of a general deism, I think I would say, is that God is love. I heard the other day um, that I was at a, a coach track, as I, as I mentioned before, I coach track and field. And, and there was this, this wonderful young lady that, that is not in the track team, but comes to our track meets and she's talking to her friends. And, and one of the comments she made is, well, I'm a loving person. And then she paused to most people. And so I thought it was just this funny, uh, really dynamic of, of trying to make it sound like, okay, well, love wins. I'm loving, but then there always is that, like, when's the shoe going to drop dynamic? So we can use this idea of God is love really pointing away from God's truth and trying to justify our behavior. So we're talking about love, 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 but it's not the same love, and it can be used in a political sense. What are your, what would be your well, encouragement and, and uh, what would you say to that? You remember when I talked about the four different kinds of love that yes. we have in the original languages? Yes. You can have a condition on love, but that's not what we are talking about here. When you ask God, do you love me? I want you to envision this. I'm opening my hands wide open and if there's a piece of wood behind me, what I'm nailed to, which Christ did. That's how much he loves you. If you doubt there is love, take a look at the cross. Take a look at the empty tomb. Mm. Take a look at the manger. Take a look at the body and blood. That is love in action. This is what Paul talks about in 1 Corinthians 13. The world's perspective of love flows from within. Our love is the eternal Again, we're going to end up with verse 19. We love, but why? Because he first loved us. I have a plaque in my mother tongue in Arabic. One of my classmates from the seminary had called my wife and said, could you have Nabil look at his Bible in Arabic and find First John 4, 19? And he put that in four different languages, Arabic, Greek, Latin and Hebrew, and I have it in my office. All of it stands because he first loved me. And out of that love, we love others. Not conditionally, but as much as humanly speaking, by the Spirit's power, we love as he loved us, so that we can make a difference in someone's life. As I spoke about the lady in St. James, uh, Missouri, she heard somebody say, beloved. Mm. And that was enough for her to come to church to be fed and nurtured and nourished. And this is what you and I do as the followers of Jesus. We testify that we are his beloved children. And in that love, we painted on the hearts of people with a wide brush with multitude of colors and imagery so that in all we say and in all we do, 
we reflect the love of God that was revealed in his humility in a manger as he rose victoriously from the grave and as he sends us out as his ambassadors to the world. Well, Pastor, you know what? That summarizes everything that we are saying here today, and we are out of time. So Pastor Nabil Noor of Trinity Lutheran Church in Hartford, South Dakota, giving us God's strong word from 1 John chapter 4. Pastor Noor, happy Easter, and thank you for bringing us his gifts. God's blood thanks to you and to all of you, beloved, baptized, beautiful, blood-bought saints. I'm your host, Brady Finner, and pastor of Messiah Lutheran Church in Sartell, Minnesota. Thank you for joining us, and the Lord keep you safe in the palm of his hand.